This is Fun with 3rd through 5th grade elementary, Code HS, and your presenter is going to be Portia Morrell, one of our professional development specialists. My name is Cindy Baldacchini. I'm actually an elementary curriculum developer. And as you heard, this session is being recorded. It will be shared publicly with the slides. So next week, you will get links to the recording and to the slides. So you know, have confidence, even if something happens with your internet. I know there are some bad storms out there today. A couple of people were dropping. Don't worry, you will have the video. Um, and before I turn it over to Portia, in the chat, there is a link to Scratch. If you want to follow along today and you have not used Scratch, or perhaps you have you don't have a Scratch account, you can click the link in the... I love, I love your comment, Lori. So true. If you want to click that link in the chat, um, you can just use a guest account and Portia will show you what to click. Our other support person today is Sandy Alstrom, another elementary curriculum developer. So Portia, I'm going to turn it over to you. All righty, let's share my screen. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Portia Morell, and I'm a PD specialist here at Code HS. Um, I also lead the elementary PD, so I'm uh, just a big fan of just elementary in general because this is a, a space where computer science can have, where you can have a lot of fun with your students with low stakes and just really invoke that play combined with computer science and interdisciplinary uh, concepts to create projects, visuals, animations, things like that. In this session, we will focus on third through fifth grade and our chosen language here at Code HS Elementary is Scratch. And I'll go over some housekeeping things, some intro stuff, and then we'll just spend a lot of our time playing in Scratch. So let's go over the slides. The first thing I would like to know is what is your background in Scratch? And in the chat, I would like for you to either type in a one saying that you have never used it, two, that you have used it a bit, and three, if you have taught with Scratch, just to get um, the lay of the land, seeing who is in the room. All right, we have a lot of threes. Scratch has been around for a long time. So I would hope and assume that there are a good amount of people who have used Scratch before. I'm going to actually add a, a second follow-up to that is, if you could write in the chat, how do you use Scratch? And do you use it um, as computer science? Do you use it in interdisciplinary ways? Whatever way you use it in your classroom, I would love to know that. So in, your ch in the chat, go ahead and just type in a, a simple statement of how you use Scratch in your classroom. All right, I see computer science, teaching coding principles, enrichment program, exploratory with middle school mm -hmm. students to create music, which is great. I have done a, a couple of things with music and Scratch, using it as a computer science teacher. So as you can see, just in the chat that people use Scratch in many different ways. Um, and I think now that Scratch has gone through its third version, that it's even more accessible now than it was before, because all you need to do is click a link and you're, as long as you have internet, you can um, interact with Scratch. There are offline versions too, as, so if you do in install the software, you could also interact with Scratch as well. So thank you all for sharing. We even have a family code night, which is a great opportunity to uh, share computer science, not just in the classroom, but with the community, with parents who probably don't even know anything <laughs> about computer science. And computer um, Scratch is a great entryway or anything dealing with block-based coding, in, in my honest opinion, is a, a great um, way to introduce computer science. So thank you so much for sharing. And hopefully, if you never considered these other um, ways to use Scratch that you feel inspired by what other teachers are doing in their schools and districts. All right, so today's agenda. We will spend the rest of our time pretty much going over 
uh, Scratch and uh, playing in Scratch, I will pretty much mimic a, a lesson plan that you get for free at for the this session, but using my own spin to it, adding extra stuff because we probably will have time. Um, but you'll get to play, build something, and also take home a lesson that you can do in your classroom. So just to go over the mission, I apologize for those of you who have been in multiple sessions with me, but our mission here at Code HS is to empower all students in a meaningfully um, to meaningfully impact the future. So uh, through code and through creating things that could help people um, is part of our mission in empowering students to be able to do that. So elementary is where it starts. And so I'm happy that you're here to learn more and explore more in Scratch because that positive experience in elementary could lead to um, other things in the future for students. In fact, I learned how to program uh, with Logo in seventh grade. This is before Scratch ever existed. Um, and even though it was text-based, it was visually uh, appealing because it's very similar to if you ever use the turtle in either Python or um, the drawing in Scratch, it's very similar to making shapes with commands. So uh, because of that experience, I knew exactly what computer science was. And when I pursued it back in college, um, it wasn't a mystery. I knew exactly what I was getting into. It was hard, but it wasn't a mystery. So yeah. So here's some background about Scratch, just in case if you do not know. Scratch is um, different from Scratch Junior. If you were in my last session, I mentioned in Scratch Junior, you do not know, you do not need to read anything really. But in Scratch, everything is in a, it's in text-based kind of format. Even though it's blocks, you're you still need to read the block commands. There are ways to change the language so it's not just in English. And if you are, you know, teaching in a dual language program, or if you, I was, I used to work in a bilingual school, so I had to show my students how to use it in French as well. There are abilities to change the language so that um, that is not a barrier. So just to, I'll show you how to do that if you do not know how to do that already. It's available on the web and it's also available to download. We will just use the web version for this session, but there are availabilities to download the software. And we have programming blocks pretty much to cover every computer science concept, including variables, if statements, and functions. And we will probably use some variables in our program today. And I wrote that you can make any 2D animation in games. I've seen some pretty advanced projects where students are trying to do 3D. It is possible, it's just very complex. So that's why I did not put 3D in there. Oh so, yeah. All right, so let's explore. I know that Cindy has put this link in the chat multiple times, but this is that opportunity to go ahead and click it if you have not. What will happen is once you click that link, you will see scratch.mit.edu, and this is the main screen. The coolest thing I like about the main screen is that you get to see what students around the world are building. This section here is called Feature Projects. And when I used to teach this in after school, we used to give our students some time to explore for the week what current um, feature projects are there because uh, there are some really cool ones and it kind of gives uh, some hype of, around building things in Scratch because students will say, hey, did you see that flying burrito project on the main screen this week? And they'll get into playing the game. And uh, I think playing is, is important because they can see what's possible by interacting with it. Obviously you want to, um, set how much time they have, because if you let them, they will play forever. But just giving that opportunity for them to explore, I think is very important. So you can do that down here. What we will focus on is creating something. So 
I am not signed into my accounts. And I did that for a reason because I just wanted you to know that you can do, you can create right away just by clicking on the create button, even without being signed in. The benefit of signing in is that you could, uh, whatever, whenever you press the create button, it's automatically attached to an account so that it is, uh, you can save it to that account, but it's okay if you don't have one. So I will go ahead and press the create button and look at my main space. So here is Scratch and I apologize if I am going over some things that you already know how to do. But since we have people in the room and people who may be watching this recording that may not know what Scratch is, I will go over some uh, basic concepts. So um, at the top, just in case if you need to have Scratch in a different language, what you will do is click on this world icon and then you select the language that you would like to translate to. So as I mentioned before, I used to teach um, in a bilingual school and I needed my students to use French. So they would go and click on this global globe icon and find French and the blocks automatically switch to French. So I wanted to just show you where that language change was. Go back to English. And by default, even if I had pro a program in the middle where you write your code, um, it would translate into that language. So it, it all will convert, except for the, the text that you type in a bubble, but that's a little different. On the left side are all of our coding blocks. Um, I'll go through some of them, but not all of them. There are a lot to explore. And I actually recommend if you are really into um, looking to see what Scratch can do, I actually recommend looking at the, the Scratch Wiki because they explain how the blocks work. And I've actually learned a little bit more about what Scratch can do by reading the Wiki as well. To create characters, we add characters down in this bottom section. By default, we see the cat, but we can go ahead and delete the cat and create our own um, uh, sprite, or we could uh, pick a sprite from the sprite library. So first, let's delete the cat by clicking on the delete button right here. And then you'll find this cat plus icon down at the bottom. And when you hover over it or when you put your mouse on it, it will show or display four options. And I'll show, I'll explain what all four options do, but I will only choose one of them. Uh, so you can upload images um, as a sprite. So that's how you do that. By the way, if you have images that are in a GIF form, like the animated images, you can actually import those and it will separate each image as a costume. And so I actually like to do this for um, characters that have like multiple animations. Uh, you can press this little surprise button and you'll get a random character. Um, you can paint a character on the screen and you can choose a sprite from the library. I'm just going to choose a sprite from the library just for the sake of time. Because the library is so extensive, you can um, use the search box or use any of these toggles to specific themes. Since we're in spring, I am going to do a spring related uh, project. So I'm going to go ahead and add the butterfly to my uh, screen. If you hover over any of the characters, if you see an animation going, that means that there are multiple costumes in that sprite. And what that really means is if there are multiple costumes, it is easier to make animations because animations are just changing between multiple costumes. So I am going to click on butterfly one. And here is my butterfly one on the screen. So each sprite has uh, the ability to have its own code in it. So the, the program goes in the middle. I won't code quite yet. Let's add a background so that we have a full stage going on. So to add a backdrop, what we do is go all the way to the bottom right. And then we select the choose a backdrop um, picture plus icon. 
I'll just use the choose a backdrop. We have the same options as the sprites. The only difference between sprite and backdrop behaviors is that the backdrop does not move. So all of the coding blocks that are available for the backdrop are everything except for motion. And that makes sense because the behavior of the backdrop is that you're not expecting it to move. So that's why there are no motion features. So I'll add a backdrop. We are in the spring, so why not find something springy? Ooh, the forest. So I have clicked the forest and now my, my butterfly is kind of blending in. So I'm going to just quickly re-design um, my butterfly to just change the color. So if I would like to make changes to my costumes of my sprites, we don't go here. This is the whole entire character. What we do is we look at these other tabs that are attached to the sprites. Uh, not only is code attached to the sprite, but the character costumes are attached to the sprite. So if I click on the this costumes tab, I can see all of the different costumes that I have available for this sprite. I am only going to change the color of the first one, but I could do it for all of them if I'd like to. So I'm going to change the color of this green here by clicking on the paint bucket and then going to the fill section to change the color. Um, first, I'll change the, the color itself. Maybe I'll do a, a blue. And then you can change the saturation and brightness. And the, the final color will appear up here. There are other ways to also change the color. You can do gradient and all of these other ones, but I'll just keep a solid color because it's the easiest. And then I can just click on those spaces. Not every character that you use or modify will have the same features. There are two ways to edit a... Uh, picture or a costume inside of Scratch. This is vector mode, which means that every single uh, shape is kind of its own object so that you can move that item around, modify it and things like that. That's vector mode. We do have the old school bitmap mode where once you draw on the screen, it's all um, kind of squished map down together, meaning that if you want to erase something, you're using an eraser that's erasing everything. These are, Vector kind of gives you more, um, more features for designing things. And I would actually recommend if you are looking for your students to uh, not really become graphic designers, but have more time in building graphics and designing things, the vector version of Scratch is great for that because it's simple enough for them to create objects and things like that. So highly recommend it. Anywho, so I've changed my color. I'm content with that. I can go in here since I've already made the color and just change that for all of them. Since I already have it here. And now all of my costumes have the same look. Once you're done with your costumes, you can go back to your code and we are going to program something. The program that we'll do is the same lesson that you're going to get. And it's a chasing game where this butterfly is going to um, pretty much chase a flower. And so maybe we should build that flower because I don't can't remember if we have a flower inside of Scratch library. Let's see. Uh, search flower. No flowers. Okay. So since there are no flowers, let's go ahead and quickly create one. So what I'll do is go back to my cat plus and then do the paint icon. Your flower does not need to be perfect. Please accept that. I'm going to do something pretty quickly. So I am going to let's zoom in just a little bit and minimize this. So I'm just looking at scratch. I'm going to go ahead and make a center circle. And I just selected a circle um, tool right here. If you hold down shift and then drag and draw, you'll get a perfect circle. Make sure that you let go of your mouse 
first before you let go of shift in order to keep that perfect circle um, as is. If you draw without holding down shift, you end up with this. So if you want to save time, it, I think that using uh, keyboard shortcuts could help, especially even if you're trying to teach this with students, keyboard shortcuts would help too. So I held, I held down shift and then I dragged down the circle and I let go of my mouse first before I let go of shift to create that perfect circle. And then what I want to do is kind of um, make this a little smaller, oops. And put that here. It's okay if it's kind of big here cause I can just resize the whole entire image. So you don't have to be mindful of this cause I can just change the size from a hundred to something smaller. Okay, so there is our circle. And now all we need to do is make a couple of ovals on the side and a different color. Let's do this nice blue, why not, or pink, here we go. So I'm just going to make a couple of ovals, maybe just one, and then do it around. So the easiest way to do this is to do a copy paste, okay? So on the keyboard, it's, uh, if you're on a Mac, it's Command C or Command V. If you're on a Windows, it's, I do believe, Control C, Control V. So control C or command C is a uh, copy and command V or control V is paste. So copy and then do a couple of pastes around and you can rotate the pedal by clicking and dragging the arrow that's at the bottom of the shape. Just look for that little arrow icon right here. And then we'll talk about layering. If you want this center of the flower to be on top, we can change that with no problem. But let's go ahead and just fix this really quickly. Please accept that your flower will not be perfect. I'm also saying that for myself. So, yeah. There we go. My not perfect flower. All right, so how do we get this middle center to be on top? Well, we have a couple of other features up here. Copy and paste is something that you can click on, um, but I think the keyboard shortcuts, like I mentioned before, are much faster. Uh, but we do have these arrows called forward, backward, front, and back. And this is how we can layer. So if I want this to go automatically to the front, I can just press the front button. and. Now, this center piece is in the front. If I wanted it to go back, I'd just press this. But if I want it to go between layers, you would use forward and backwards. Um, so yeah. So I'll give you one more moment to finish your flower, be at peace with it not being perfect, and then we'll program. And let me know if there are any questions about the editor. Okay. So once you're done with your flower, we have it as it's sep a separate sprite. Um, I'm going to go back to the code tab, make this slightly bigger. And I also want to rename this by default when you are painting something, a, painting a sprite, it'll be labeled as sprite in a number. Since I know that this is a flower and I know that my students are older, they should be able to rename their characters so they know exactly what they are. So this is a flower. I'm also going to, in the property section for this sprite, I know that I'm talking to this sprite because um, I see the image of the 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 current um, costume is right here, and it's there's like this blue halo effect on the current selected sprite, and also can see the sprite name here and some other properties. I'm going to change the size of this because it's way too big, and my stage is this only is only this amount of space, so 
it is important for you to kind of resize things because this is this is all you have is this amount of space. So go ahead and resize from zero to a hundred, whatever you'd like. You can even, I think you can go past a hundred if you want it to, but um, I know my shape is too big. So I made it smaller by changing the size here. Okay. So we are going to program our butterfly to move with our mouse. And to do that, we always need to start off with an event. How does this program activate? So pretty much, how do I get my um, character to follow me? And when do I want that to happen? And for me, I want it to happen when I click on the green flag. So when I click on the green flag, I want the butterfly to automatically follow where my mouse pointer is. So in events, that is the first block that I will use to activate that event. So I zoomed in a lot just so that you can see that block when green flag is clicked. Now I'm going to motion because that deals with the movement of my character. So somewhere in motion, I need to find a block that will allow me to uh, allow the character to follow the mouse pointer. Um, I have a block called go to that I can use, but I don't want it to go to a random position. I want this to go to the mouse pointer. And I know that this exists in here because I've spent a lot of time in Scratch. Um, and so some things you kind of like unlock by just playing um, because by default, it doesn't say right here that you can go with the mouse pointer. Uh, so in you, I want this to go to the mouse pointer when I click on it. All right, so I clicked the green flag and because my mouse was all the way up here, I clicked it and my butterfly went exactly there. But now I did activate the program, uh, but it's not continuously following me. And that is because I need to control this block to repeat pretty much forever in this case. So I'm going to go to control and find the forever loop. And this means that whatever lives inside of this block will run forever pretty much until you press stop. So I'm going to press the green flag again. And now notice that my mouse pointer, the character will go to the mouse pointer forever. You can also read that when green flag click forever, go to mouse pointer. So this is a, another way to break down code. It's not just expecting the students to know exactly what to find, but to kind of like write out what they want the program to do and then find the blocks that uh, match up with that idea. So now we have our character moving around the screen. And I can put this in full screen by clicking on these uh, four arrows right here. And you can see this in full screen, which the students like to see more because it's focused on the game and not just the code but I can minimize that. I will pause really quickly just to see if there are any questions. All right. Now what we would like to do is have our um, flower move around the screen because I want to make a game where this character, this butterfly, when I touch the flower, I want it to um, hide, but if we have time, I can also add a variable where they can get a point when they um, touch the flower. But first we need the flower to move around the screen. So I will click on the flower to program the flower's um, effect to move around the screen. I want this to happen at the beginning of my program. So I will use when green flag clicked as well. well green flag is clicked as well. So. What I would like it to do is something in motion. Now I could do this whole go to random position, but I wanna show you what happens. Every time I click, it just jumps to that location, right? So if you don't want this feature, but you still want it to move around, there is another block called glide, which is a combination of moving to a, another location and actually seeing it happen. So I'm going to try this block instead. 
And notice every time I click on the green flag, it glides to a random position. This is a great activity because in Scratch, there are so many blocks. And sometimes the students actually do get confused about what to use. It's pretty much what do you want it to do and how do you want it to look? These both do the same thing, but it has a different effect. So I like this better, but maybe a student likes this one better. And so giving them the option, I think you should go ahead and give them the option. So I want this to glide, but I want it to glide around forever. Let's see what happens when I do that. Let's run. All right. So if I glide around forever, <laughs> the forever loop is pretty fast. So if you want to slow this down, we do have a block in control called wait. So you can have things move for move around forever, but you can still slow down the block by using the wait one second block inside of control. So if I add this, now my um, character, my flower won't glide to the next position until after one second. If you want this to be a little bit faster, you can do decimals. So you can do point uh, 0, 0.0 something, and it will do it slightly faster, but still have a little bit of a pause. So you can play with the time, which is pretty cool. So I think I'll just do 0.5 for mine. Okay. So now that I have my, um, butterfly following my arrow, and I also have my flower going around, I want to create a um, interaction where if I am touching, if the butterfly is touching the flower, that it hides and then um, maybe appears in a different spot when it, when it glides back to that place. So let's see how we can do that. So I'm going to stay in the flower and create another program inside of here. And so I love this about Scratch. This concept is called parallelism, where you can have multiple um, codes or multiple um, events happening in one character, and it will work just fine. So you don't have to have everything all in one space. You can have everything in separate sections, but it's still in the same character. So for this part, I want to say that I am looking to see if I'm touching the, if the butterfly is touching the flower. So I'm going to go to control and find the if statement. And then I need something that fits in here. So the shapes do matter. Um, only things with this diamond shape can fit inside of this if statement. And so that type of uh, shape is a, a concept called the Boolean, which would return a true or false, pretty much saying, is this happening? Yes. Is this, if it's not, or if it is happening, then it's a yes, true. Uh, if it's not happening, then it's a no false idea. So I'm going to go to sensing and grab this block that I know can sense if I am touching another character. So sensing, you're going to grab touching the first block and hover over this diamond and you'll see that it highlights. That means that Scratch knows exactly where you want it to go. You let it go and then it goes there. I'm saying these things for a reason because I've actually seen when when students are first learning how to use Scratch, sometimes they do have a um, a learning curve when it comes to dropping things in the right place. So I'm just letting you know how you can identify where it goes. All right, so I want this to say, if touching butterfly one. So I will click this to change it to butterfly one. So if I'm touching the butterfly one, I want to hide. That is the flower. The flower is going to hide. I'm going to grab show for a reason. These live together. If you hide, 
you have to have a pro uh, somewhere in your code to show it again because it will never show again because you never told it to show again. So let's see what happens. I'm going to stop and run again. And automatically, because my flower and my butterfly, I got lucky, uh, were touching, it automatically is hidden. So I can hover over here and see that the flower is actually still moving. It's just um, not showing. So I need to put this show block somewhere in here. So I'm going to put it at the top. Why not? Let's run this again. And I touched it and it automatically shows again because, oh, what? Oh, I know why. It's because I don't have a forever around this. So if I want this to happen continuously, the thing about if statements, and this is a common um, error that a lot of students do, is that they automatically think that when you press the green flag, it will continuously check to see if the flower is touching the butterfly. This is not true. This statement will only run one time. And it's only running one time because you told it to run one time. If you want this to run forever or for a certain amount of time, then you need to have some type of loop. So I'm actually just the easiest loop I can use is forever because I know for a fact that if I put something in a forever, it will run for the whole entire time. There are other concepts that you can use. You can use a wait until, you can do a repeat until, things like that are a little bit more complex, but there are other strategies that you can use um, instead of just a forever and a regular repeat. So I'll put forever around this and reactivate this to make sure that it's working. Okay, it hit itself and then we'll glide to another position. Okay, touch it. It hides and then it shows again. Here we go. So this is a oppor the great opportunity where you would want your students to test their program. Make sure it works. Make sure that the base of the program works as is before you start adding additional things. So this is the base of the game. We have a few more moments uh, where I can go over extensions, some things that you can add to it. Um, but you do want to make sure that your students are testing their programs before you move on to more complex concepts. All right. So I will add a variable to keep track of how many times I touch the flower. So to add a variable, what we do is go to the variable section in the menu. And by default, there is one variable that you can um, already use. I think it depends on how you want to teach variables. You can definitely click on make a variable and have your students um, create a new variable and do all, all of those things. But honestly, since I know that this already exists and let's say my students already know how to right click because that's another struggle, uh, you can actually rename the variable. So if I right click on my mouse or on my touchpad, I can rename this variable since it's already there. Why not? So I'll click rename and I will call this score. And I'll press OK. I can show this variable or display this variable on the screen by clicking on the checkbox. You can also toggle the score value by using the blocks show and hide variable. You can do that as well. But uh, for the sake of this, we will just toggle it on. By default, the value is set to zero, but um, that is only when you first create the variable and you actually need to set the value in your program. So I will grab the block that says set score to zero and make sure that lives under a green flag clicked because um, every time you click the, the green flag, you do want your variable to reset itself. So you have to put that in your program. So once I press the green flag, my score is set to zero as it should be, and now we just need to add to it. To add to the score, we use the second block called change score by one, which really just means add one to score. 
Uh, it depends on how you want to explain that to students. In French, it actually says that. In French, it says chain add score, um, add to the score by one or something like that. But in English, it's it's different. So anywho, you'll grab this block here and figure out where it goes. Well, if I want to add one to the score, and this is a great conversation to have with your students before you even revealing where this goes, have a conversation. Well, where, when do we want to add um, one to the score? Is it when they're gliding around the screen or is it when they're touching the butterfly? You can give them choices or you can have them read the code and figure out where it goes. It's definitely up to you on the level of scaffolding, but just having that conversation will also help connect dots. Well, the answer is I want this to go where I am touching, if I'm touching the butterfly, I want to change the score by one. Let's put that there. Let's run and test. All right. Okay, first time got a point, got a couple of points in that second go. And I will tell you why sometimes you get some points, some extra points. It's because this loop is repeating pretty quickly. So if you want to slow it down from getting another point, you can add some time in here before you can get another point. So I'll do a wait 0 0.5 seconds as well here in, from control. Or you can do wait one second, depends on how you want to do it. And that will delay this ability to get another point before the, the loop repeats itself. So let's try that. Okay. Behind the scenes, technically, the uh, flower can be touching the um, butterfly, and that's just kind of part of knowing how scratch works. So if you do see extra scores happening, it's because that it's it's possible that it's gliding in the background. So maybe glide at this point is not good for you. <laughs> and you might want to go back to just jumping to a, a location so it, there's no possibility of it um, jumping around too much and touching it by accident. So just gives you variety. This actually makes it harder. <laughs> yeah. All right, so we have a few more minutes. Let's add some extra things. Uh, kids like effects. So I will actually add something in looks and sound in when we touch the butterfly. So I want to add a sound. There is a whole sounds tab in um, every sprite. So you can click the sounds tab and then go down here to find a sound from the library. So I will press the choose a sound and you can press the play button or hover over it and it will play that sound. There are themes as well as you can search because over time when I use sound, there are certain sounds that I just really like. So I can just search those. Um, let's do space, why not? Or effects and just choose a sound. Um. I don't know. I'm entertained by dun, dun, dun. So I chose that. Uh, but once again, in order to choose something, you just click on any of the sounds that you want after you've decided which one you want. I would also time this because you can get really involved with the sounds. <laughs> um, so give your students a certain amount of time to choose a sound. And speaking of timing, we have about a minute left here, and then there is no break before we go to the final room. So I'm going to post that in the chat. And then as you wrap up, Portia, people can go over there to join the raffle and for the wrap up. So yeah. go ahead and wrap it up. All right. So um, the slides that you'll receive, they're really short. Uh, but this is the lesson. We actually went through the, the base of the lesson. I was just adding add-ons. So you will have that inside of the slides as well as some other information about if you are interested in um, getting a license with elementary, as well as knowing that we are working on Scratch and Scratch Junior to live in Code HS as well. I thank you so much for 
being here with me. And I even got super, super involved that I even forgot the time because <laughs> I was looking at the time and then I forgot that it was only 45 minutes. But I thank you so much for being here. What we will do now is move to the main room to wrap up this session, not just this session, but the entire uh, conference. And so we thank you so much for being here. And I hope you had a lot of fun with Scratch like I did. Thank you.